personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast brought to you by Ammo.com. Conquer or die. That's a cool motto, and it was the first ever flown over an American military victory. Today, we're talking about the Bedford flag, an archaic little piece of vexillology with an interesting history behind it. We love vexillology here at the Resistance Library podcast and at Ammo.com. We have a whole series on there on flags we've talked about some of them in the past um and the bedford flag is weird because and 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 i mean something very specific when i say that it's weird what i mean is is that the design of the bedford flag owes much more to uh you know medieval heraldry than kind of a modern um flag you know whether it be the kind of stars and stripes or the french tricolor or even something like you know the gadsden flag um the very fact that there's a french banner around a guy's arm holding a dagger is like you know it's 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 old um and we're not really sure how old we know that it goes back to sometime in the early 18th century, but <clears throat> historians used to think that it went as far back as um, the 1660s, but that was proven false because the color Prussian blue did not exist until 1704. Um, I don't really know how that's known, but it's an interesting little fact, especially if you're one of these people who doesn't think that the Greeks knew what blue was. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a deep cut for y'all out there. Um, Just lost all our Greek listener. <laughs> I'm sure that they could, but this is like a theory people have is that the ancient Greeks didn't know what blue was. It just seems a little silly to me. Um, no, it's, it's square, which I understand makes it a cavalry flag. I would imagine that would be so it doesn't drag on the ground as you're riding a horse. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I mean, it's also like it's I think square. I think flags in the in, pa- in the past were mostly square. This is another thing that lends to it. It's kind of weird, you know. It's art. It's art. It has an archaic quality about it. You know, I wouldn't show you this, and you go, oh, "That looks like an American flag." Yeah, yeah. I thought it was something William Wallace would use. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, you know. It, it, yeah. It looks like something knights would carry into battle, um, and. It, it has red on it, which I guess is part of its, you know, cavalry design. Again, it has a heraldic kind of set of images in it. Um, and the flag, conquer or die, is very, very similar to the motto of several Scottish and Irish clans. Um, victory or death was a popular battle cry among the revolutionaries. I think that the the French part of it is like one of the weirder things to me. I mean, I know that, you know, French was kind of the language of the uh, educated during this time period. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, it's odd because it's not, not Latin, you know, but French. Was it not Latin? I don't believe it's Latin. I believe that's French. Huh. I thought Vincette Al Marire was. Was Latin. I'm looking, and again, I'm going to sound like I, an I idiot now. It's actually, it is Latin. So I'm dumb and ignore everything I just said about it being French. Uh, ah, good. My high school Latin teacher would be proud of me. <laughs> if she was alive. So we 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 don't know how widespread this thing was used, or you know, a lot about its actual use, but we do know it was used, and there is evidence that it was flown at the Battle of Concord. Uh, because of the diaries of a Minuteman by the name of Nathaniel Page, who was present at and participated in the battle. Um, Nathaniel Page was a cornet. 
He claimed that the flag was given to his father in 1737. Um, his father was the cornet of the troop of horse. This is some archaic stuff we're doing right here. Uh, he was a cavalry officer, and his responsibility was bearing the militia's flag. That was a huge deal during those times, much like, you know, drummer boys and whatnot. And the towns of uh, Bedford and Billerica, uh, <laughs> just like weird to me that Billerica figures into history in any way whatsoever. Um, those records indicate that in addition to uh, John Page, the father, uh, his uncle and grandfather were also listed as cornets for the local Massachusetts Bay militias. And so, like other men in his family, he went on to you know, be responsible for the local battle flag. Um, when he left his home in Bedford on April 17th, 1775, he was warned that British troops were en route. And on his way out, he, you know, it makes sense that he would have brought the flag of his militia with him and that he would have flown it during the fight that occurred that morning. And historians do agree that he was present for the Battle of Concord. The Battle of Concord took place almost immediately after the Battle of Lexington. Um, they're generally collapsed into, you know, the Battle of Lexington Concord. They were at Concord. Um, God, I was talking like a foreigner for a second. <laughs> um, this is how you know when somebody's from you know, not, not local. Like when in my, Opie and Anthony did a, did a special uh, Boston homecoming show in the nineties when they were exiled from Boston. And they knew that they knew that callers were from New York when they were saying they were from Concord and Peabody and, you know, none of this makes sense to anybody who's not from New England. Boston. <laughs> or like Wor Worcester is the, is like the one that's, you know, People have people have trouble with uh, with, with with that. Um, and I believe Concord is where the prison is now. Yeah. But anyway, the British Watch regulars out for shower grapes. <laughs> yeah, right. The uh, the British regulars won a brief skirmish at Lexington. Continued marching toward Concord to capture material, and the gathering American militias who'd been warned that the Redcoats were on the march traveled west, congregated on the other side of the North Bridge, which was about one mile from the village. Smoke was seen rising from Concord. The American cavalry troops moved much closer to the village. They were concerned that the British were going to burn it, um, and the British forces decided not to engage and retreated to the North Bridge. The colonial fighters were led by a man named James Barrett. He was the colonel of the Concord, Mili Concord Militia. And, you know, those the militia was told to load their weapons, but not to fire unless fired upon. They did end up firing uh, on the orders of John Buttrick, who yelled, fire for God's sake, fellow soldiers, fire, after British troops shot two Bedford Minutemen, um, aiming over one another's head and shooting over neighbors' shoulders, as was the style at the time. The American rebels fired against the King's troops. This was the first time th that they ever fired on, you know, British troops. What a feeling that must have been. I mean, what a, what a committal to take a shot at the King's guys themselves. I mean, the flag is, the flag is appropriate for that because it really... Really oh, yeah. would have been Concord. You in I mean, this is not like a. Uh, oof. It's not like a. It's not like a cool, you know. I mean, maybe it is today. Like it's cool sounding, you know, kind of kind of hard guy slogan like "Conquer or Die." But like, it's not. It's a simple statement of fact for these guys. Like, we win mm -hmm. this battle or we die. Exactly. I mean, you know, the whole resist and revolt mentality that's been in vogue as of late. Washington and his boys knew they were all going to get turned into wind chimes if they didn't come out of this thing victorious. It's quite different stakes for the uh, revolutionaries. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I mean, from the perspective of these guys fighting, it's like their entire way of life is kind of on on the line. It's like even if you, you manage to somehow 
you know, live through it and not be turned into a wind chime, the con- the social consequences for what it would mean for you and your family and, you know, your kind of way of life were also, I think, very present in their minds. Um, the battle, co- the, the red coats were outnumbered and outmaneuvered in the battle. This caused them to flee and they left their dead and wounded behind. So it must have been a pretty hasty retreat. Uh, once that battle was over, Paige took the flag home and it went up on the mantle and appears nowhere in the historical record until about, is it about 100? Yeah, it's, it's exactly 100 years later. Uh, 1875, his grandson Cyrus sends the flag to Concord for the centennial celebration of the battle. And Cyrus relates Nathaniel's story to the historian Abram English Brown. That is an old Yankee name, if ever there was one. Mm. Um, and before he died, the flag was donated to the Bedford Library, where I am double-checking. Um, I believe you can still see today. It sure looks like it. Yeah, it is. So it's in a place called the Flag Balcony of the Bedford Library. You have to ask at the library circulation desk. I have no idea to, to what degree they're open. Um, no flash photography, only five people in the room at a time. Uh, it's the extremely climate controlled environment. So you have to stand in there with the flat, you know, with the door uh, closed the entire time. It had been my understanding that um, the guy's granddaughter or great granddaughter had actually taken a piece off of the flag to put on her dress or had it, had it been under a misunderstanding? Um, that is a legend we will get to in a in a bit but that may be the case and if i could find you know is that the actual bedford flag okay this is the actual bedford flag i'm looking at now there's parts of it that are missing um so that may be the case i mean it almost like doesn't look real when you look at it It doesn't look like a flag it looks like somebody painted this you know, for like a, a game of, of, of Warhammer or something. Um, <laughs> and Bedford, um, for anybody who's visiting the area or anybody just listening <clears throat> to this from the uh, greater Boston area, uh, Bedford is, because this is one of these like, you know, you grew up in New England your entire life. You have no idea where actually Bedford is. Um, it's, it's, it's stone's throw from Lexington, uh, about where route three joins with 95 slash 128. Um, if you're local, you know, the area, if you're not, then I don't know, look it up in your tourist guide. Um, but that's where you can go see it. Um, it, it's very strange looking and I don't just mean the design. I mean like the paints and everything. There's like, you can see paint strokes on it. Um, it's very archaic. I, I, I don't know what other word there is for it. It has this very like primitive archaic kind of quality to it where it very much does look like, you know, the local militia just painted up a flag, which is what it is. So it's not surprising that it, that it looks like that. Um, other than the page family's kind of internal stories, diaries, chatter, family legend, things of that nature. There's no documented evidence of the Bedford flag flying during the Battle of Concord. No one else mentions it. Huh. None of the diaries, none of the memoirs, none of the testimonials uh, from either the colonial or the British forces. Um, but here's the flip side of that. It could easily have been there and no one would have noticed it because it wouldn't have probably been the only flag. Um, it wouldn't have been on, you know, like a 20 foot pole or something. It would have just been on the end of some six foot pike or whatever that some guy is carrying around. Um, Mm. so, and I suppose it would have become enveloped in smoke pretty quickly. Would have become enveloped. I mean, it also like this, the, yeah, enveloped in smoke. Yeah. But it's like the whole kind of environment doesn't really lend itself to, to people, you know, other than like this guy who's it's his kind of his family flag as well. 
Yeah. Um, it, the environment of it doesn't lend itself to guys being like, oh, whoa, look at that cool flag over there. <laughs> British people are shooting at you. That's a nice flag. Yeah. You're getting shot at. You're getting cannonballed, you know, whatever. And uh, and there's, you know, 20 other flags around because everybody's bringing their own standard. I mean, there's not, you know, there weren't really official flags during this stage of the revolution. And a lot of and it's, and at this point in history, most official flags of places are not like the national flag. It's the, it's the, it's the personal standard of the monarch, you know? So like the UK has a flag and that's not, you know, King George's personal flag that just becomes the, the flag of the nation. But like, I don't, I don't, I know France didn't have one. And I don't think that Spain did. And I would be extremely surprised if uh, the Habsburg realms, which is like kind of Austria, I would be very surprised if if they had a national flag that wasn't just, you know, the, the royal standard. So, you know, as uh, and there was a there was a flag for British North America, but I don't think it was official. Uh, but flags are like, you know, the whole like concept of, well, once you got a country, now you get a flag thing. Just like, d- like what's a country is kind of a open question at this mm. point in history. So there would have been many flags. Most of them probably would have been along the same lines of the Bedford flag, where it's just like somebody threw something together at some point. And it became the standard of the militia. They carry it into battle. Um, they're very protective of it because that's kind of just the military culture of the time but and some of them are just like things that had been laying around they maybe had never um been in battle a lot of times companies would design their flags if they were or if a new company gets organized I mean, we've talked about the, the culpepper flag um i don't know if we've had a commodore perry flag episode on here but we have a commodore perry article on mo.com um and you know, some of these are just like, well, we got a company together, so we need we need a flag, um, kinds of things. So, I'm going with, you know, I I, I think that um, I think that the memoirs of this one family are probably, you know, I don't think that you have to like necessarily quote unquote trust them, but I think hmm. that you're not really going to get any better evidence, you know. Uh, yeah. Sure. Well, we know the guy was there. We know this was this heirloom war flag. Not huge leaps of faith required to safely assume that Bedford was present. Yeah, and so you know, this is this is probably the um, earliest. You know, it's the first uh, American military victory, and well, I think that's a. I don't think that's actually true, um, because I think that you know the French and Indian wars were an American war. Um, But anyway. Yeah. Well, it's like the Canadians taking credit for burning down the white house during the war of 1812. I say, technically you have to actually be a country if you want (laughs) to claim victory. So French and Indian war is good for us, but we had not become America yet. Still the British at that point. eh? That's a, that's a, that's a fair response. Um, to which I would counter that while there was not an American government, that there were an American people. So I, I'm not like my hill to die on is not that the French and Indian War was an American victory. I just think that it's uh, it, it bears reflecting on whether or not Amer- the American military, as in the military of the American people, had yeah. victories prior to the American Revolution. Well, surely created some tradition that was passed down and and cherished by future generations of fighters. I tell you what, I'll hedge my bets. I don't want any angry letters from French American Indian war veterans. So uh, (laughs) I'm going to count it as one of ours. Now I want to know if I have ancestors that fought in that war because, uh, well, because I like, you know, knowing about my ancestors fighting in wars that happened hundreds of years ago. Does your lineage go back that far in America? Uh, My family arrived in the what is now the United States in 1630, hey, um, nice. and they fought in the War of 1812, and they fought for the Union Army 
uh, in the Civil War. I think one of my ancestors was like a captain in the American Civil War. And that's pretty much the end of it because uh, my mother's family were all farmers and my father's family were all ministers. And those are hmm. the and those are two of the main groups of people who don't get drafted. But my great grandfather on my father's side was a chaplain during World War One, like at like at the front, you know, not like at the, the training facility or something. But yeah, mostly. And my and my you know great grand my my grandfather who like wasn't a minister had one eye, uh, and my father's epileptic, so. There's not not a lot of my brother's in the army for six years, uh, but it was you know he was in, in the army for six years between, uh, you know like 1983 and 1989. So uh, he didn't see he didn't see a lot of action. But yeah, my family in America goes back to 1630, and uh, my grandmother could trace her lineage to the uh, Norman invasion. Hmm. That's that's amazing. As a guy who's kind of not sure who his great grandparents were, that's impressive to me. I think that the Norman invasion thing, you know, I like, I, I, I think is, um, I think it's fanciful. I think it's one of these like, you know, fanciful ancestries that people kind of like, you know, it's like, it, 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 I think it's basically like, um, you know, Julius Caesar claiming to be d- descended from Romulus. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's like, okay, I believe that they, I like, yeah, I believe I probably had ancestors who were involved in the Norman conquest of England, but like, were they specifically these guys and did these, that they say that they can trace their family back to and did those guys actually exist? Well, maybe. Um, but yeah, I think that like fanciful, um, you know, the fanciful genealogies that go back that far. I mean, that may be like the, that, the fact that we have one of those may, may be like more evidence of old, old stock than anything else, um, because I think that's a very, you know, old, old family English thing to do is like make up some, you know, genealogy that brings your ancestors all the way back to the Trojan War or whatever. <laughs> um, but we digress. So the Bedford flag is kind of a it's obscure, but it. At the time, it was a big symbol of the militia resistance at Concord and kind of the revolution in general. I mean, the these were not professional soldiers that were engaged in this fight. I mean, there were professional soldiers. Going back to our comments on the um, French and Indian Wars, you know, I think that there's um, there's a lot of professional soldiers around that time. It's just they're mostly in like Virginia and South Carolina and North Carolina and that kind of like, you know, mid mid south area but these guys are mostly just you know free farmers with guns and who are doing a little bit of training and not professional by any means but they're able to to fight back the world's most powerful army and it kicks off you know this is a defining um moment uh in the american in american history it's a defining moment i think in american psychology um, and our entire notion of like standing against, uh, I think that, well, I think that there's like certain, certain things that are just like inseparable from the American character and the American psyche in general. And I think that one of them is that Americans hate bullies, just kind of like instinctively dislike bullies. And I mm-hmm. think that we can perhaps trace that, you know, all the way back to, uh, the battle of Lexington. Uh, and the Battle of Concord. It also, I think, the, the archaic nature of the flag, I think, is interesting because of the way that it kind of connects um, the Anglo-Saxon and Celtic roots of the men who were fighting the British. They generally considered themselves to be British subjects who were fighting the injustice of their liberty being violated. Um, I'm sure that the more historically literate among them would have seen themselves much in the mold of the uh, Barons Rebellion, which was the rebellion that led to the drafting of the Magna Carta, or in the mold of, say, um, you know, the uh, Roundheads or parliamentarians during the English Civil War who were fighting mm. an unjust monarch. 
I, I think that that's very much how these guys would have seen themselves. I mean, I think there's obviously, you know, more radical elements like Sam, uh, Sam Adams in that milieu who were kind of, you know, didn't like the very notion of monarchy as monarchy. But I think most of these guys were like, I'm asserting my right as a, you know, I have, I, I have rights as a British subject as a free British man. I have rights and I'm asserting those rights. Um, so they didn't necessarily seek to divorce America from British rule. I, 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 at this point, I would say no, you know, and somebody can correct me, but I, I think that, you know, un, un, I mean, some did and some didn't, you know, which is all the weasel answer that covers everything. Um, but I, I would suspect that at this point in the American revolution, prior to the declaration of independence, that the question of, are we a self, do we want to assert our rights with representation in parliament or do we want to break away from the United Kingdom entirely was by, was by far not a settled question at that point that it was as, as my understanding of it goes, this was a still a subject of intense debate among even the colonists who were shooting at the British army is like, are we going to take some, you know, some deal where we get cut in and we get representation in parliament and we s- stay loyal to the crown or are we going to start our own country? And then, you know, then that breaks down into like, well, do we get our own king or do we get a republic or what do we do? But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, like, I think a part of it is just that it's at such a primal level at this point, getting back to kind of like primitive and archaic flag. I think it's almost the perfect representation for this because of the primitive and kind of like not yet ideologically clear, not yet politically and philosophically clear nature of the revolution and what it is exactly that they want out of this and not being clear, you know, like, are we, are we still British or are we something else? I think that that is, is, is probably much more of an open question uh, by which I mean, you know, some people I think would have been saying down with the crown and others would have said, you know, well, we just want, you know, we don't want to be taxed without representation of parliament. Hmm. And here we are today. Getting taxed without representation in Parliament. <laughs> this the original Bedford flag, again, it's at the Bedford Free Public Library in Bedford. Uh, you can go see it. There have been spectroscopic studies estimating that the flag was made in the early 18th century, but again, probably after 1704 because of the whole Prussian blue thing. It is Prussian in fact blue sounds like a sweet strain of marijuana, but it's just it's just my thought. Prussian blue is I have no idea why Prussian blue is Prussian. There's a um, Russian blue, that's a cat. Yeah, I have no idea why it's like I don't think it has any I think it's like French fries. Where it's like this has absolutely nothing to do with France. And I'm I'm not clear that this has anything to do with uh n- no longer extant state of Prussia. But, the kicker is every picture I've seen of the thing, it looks red. So I don't know what those it does. It does. With. No. And what's okay. So I, we should address this because this is like the, this is what everyone's going to go. What are you talking about? The flag's red. Um, if you look <laughs> at the, come on, Jamie, pull up that picture of the three by three Bedford flag. Okay. There we go. If you look at the, um, the arm on it, both the lines on the arm and the shading down at the bottom on the on the forearm and the elbow and the triceps um that's prussian blue that's the blue oh that's the prussian blue yeah but okay. yeah it's it's red it's it's red um and it is just yeah somebody painted on silk the silver fringe is gone and the legend is that it was taken by uh nathaniel's youngest sister Ruhama, I want to say that's pronounced, uh, to be used as a dress enhancement for a military ball. Um, no idea how he reacted to that, if indeed it happened. But yeah, the Bedford flag. Um, it's 
it's cool because it's a throwback to it's a, it's a real crossroads of American history and, 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 and these issues that we're talking about, about is America just, you know, is America just the United Kingdom on the North American continent, you know, is kind of ultimately the question that's still up in the air at this point. And I think that kind of no better um, flag to tie America in with the broader, you know, Anglo-Saxon um legal and political tradition that I believe forms the kind of the basis of what we mean when we say freedom, then this thing that looks like it could have been carried into battle at, you know, uh, during the English civil war or the Baron's rebellion, um, or, you know, any of these kind of ancient or medieval rather, um, struggles with the British crown that, uh, where, where, where free, Britons asserted their rights against the crown and, you know, and I do think that the American revolution very much stands in that tradition. Um, and, and I, and, and I think that, you know, these guys to some, to varying extents would have been aware that these are the, that these are the traditions that they're, um, steeped in if if for no other reason than you know their their uh ancestors were probably fighting in these in these wars i mean a lot of the people who came over during this time period were um obviously there was religious dissenters but there were some people who were just kind of like you know troublemakers for lack of a better term <laughs> and like well uh we you know we moved these troublemakers to uh, Ulster, and uh, they were great at hassling the, the Irish. And uh, maybe we can, you know, move them to Virginia, and they can hassle some Indians for us. And this is like how a lot of uh, Scots Irish ended up in the United States was the Crown just saying, "Hey, you know, we moved these guys from Scotland to Northern Ireland to." They were just kind of proto black and tans. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Very much so, yeah. Um, and they, you know, would have just that's kind of how a lot of them ended up in, you know, Virginia and North Carolina. It was like, well, uh, we need some people to, you know, <laughs> kick up dust and hassle Indians on the border. Well, we got a bunch of people kicking up dust and hassling uh, the Irish. Uh, they probably have to do the same thing in North America. And many of those people were, you know, where they were because they were uh, on, on either the right or the wrong side of this or that. Uh, struggle between the crown and parliament and the nobility, depending on what period of time we're talking about. So I, I think it's really cool because it does link America to something sort of to a history um, longer than our own. Um, I will be the first person to say that, you know, the United States is not just like Europe on the North American continent or even Britain on the North American continent. Um, I think that that's a very foolish way to look at what america is uh, but i do think that it's part of a sort of broader um anglo-saxon political tradition that ultimately comes down to um you know free men saying that they're not just going to be bossed around by the arbitrary whims of the crown and i'm sure many of you find yourself steeped in that tradition as well but the difference maker is that you got to be able to defend yourself and to defend yourself, you need ammunition and to get ammunition, you should go to ammo.com forward slash podcast, where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. Um, I don't know specifically what we have in stock right now. I do know that, especially if you're looking for bulk, um, we have got, you know, what are you, what are you looking for? Are you looking for some 38 special? Um, are you looking for some 44 Magnum? Are you looking for 223, 9 millimeter, 10 millimeter? You know, we, if we don't have it today, we will have it tomorrow. So if you go and whatever your favorite caliber is, we're out of, come back in another couple days and m- more likely than not, we'll have leveled up our inventory. Um, again, that's ammo.com forward slash podcast for $20 off any order of $200 or more. Once again, this has been the Resistance Library with Sam Jacobs for Dave Trello. 
We'll see you next time.